So my faith is huge to me. It's a big, big part of my life. How would you describe your relationship with God? I go to church every once in a while, a couple of years. I, no, I don't, I don't go. Okay, um, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a big thinker. Love the arts, love to read, um, really stimulate the mind. H how do you feel about great poetry? I absolutely love Beyonce. Okay, wow, um, yeah, hadn't really considered her before. Um, anyway, um, so when I go through hard times or struggles, I really have a character that likes to push through and just, you know, find that strength to get through the issue and get through the, I guess, get through the problem. How do you respond to tough days or hard scenarios in your life? Oh, if I have a terrible day, I just need to go home and then I play with my dog for a little bit. And then after that, I really want chocolate ice cream and somebody to talk to me. And I like to snuggle and watch the notebook and cry a little bit. And then I feel better. So the story goes that Bill and Hillary Clinton, a few years ago, had gone back to her hometown. They were driving along a little country road just outside of the town, and she says to Bill, she says, here, turn at this next corner. You know what I forgot to do? We didn't take the offering, did we? <laughs> we don't want to forget that. Bill and Hillary can hold for just a minute. <laughs> Thank you for your giving this morning. We do want to make sure we remember the important things, don't we? <laughs> All right. So let's go back to Bill and Hillary. They're on this country road, and she says, turn at this next corner. She says, there's a little country store and station two miles down the road, and I want to stop there. I want to introduce you to a guy that when I was in high school, I dated him pretty seriously. And Bill said, okay. So they went and they stopped, they met the guy, they get back in the car, they're driving down the road just a little ways and Bill looks over at her and he says, you know, Hillary, just think, if you had married him, you would have been stuck helping in that little country store all your life. And she said, no, Bill, he would have been president of the United States. <laughs> So what is it that makes marriages work? Beginning with Mother's Day today and, and going through Father's Day, we're going to talk about this issue of compatibility. And I really believe there's something that can be valuable whether you are currently in a marriage that's a very strong marriage, if you're in a marriage that there's struggles in, or, or maybe you've come through a really difficult situation and you are coming out of a marriage that's been a really bad marriage, but you want to believe that there's still life ahead of you. You've never been married and you want to make sure you make the right choices. And just in relationships in general, I think there's some truth that's going to be helpful to everyone as we talk about these weeks. And, and we're going to look at several areas of compassion compatibility that are important in building relationships. And today I want to talk about what I believe is the foundation of strong relationship in compatibility and that is spiritual compatibility. Derek Prince was one of the premier leaders of the charismatic renewal in the late 60s, 70s, 80s and into the 1990s powerful man, British, and uh, he had, during World War II, actually served in the Royal Army Medical Corps in the medical aspect of serving his nation, Britain, and was assigned to the area that at that time was known as Palestine that would later become the nation Israel. And so he was stationed in the 1940s in Jerusalem. And during that time, he had occasion to meet a lady who was running an orphanage in Ramallah, just a little ways away from Jerusalem. And she had these children that she was taking care of, a Danish lady who had ended up in that area. And she had actually adopted as this single woman, eight 
girls along with all the children she tended to in the orphanage and so Derek through meeting her began to get involved and would take as his time off opportunity to go and help out with the ministry and he found himself engaged in praying for this Lydia and praying for her ministry and what was happening and one day as he was in that time of prayer he felt God really speak into his heart and say I have joined you together under the same yoke and in the same harness now the interesting thing was Lydia was 25 years older than him so it never crossed his mind this is somebody I'm going to marry he just thought, I'm going to help her with the ministry. And yet, because this word began to burn in him, because he sensed it being so strongly from God, he found himself in looking at things differently than he had looked and began to understand that what God was saying, the yoke is that you are going to marry her and the harness is going to be the service that you're going to be engaged in together. And within a short period of time, they were married and they were married for almost 30 years and that was really the launching in those years of their marriage, his ministry that became known worldwide. She was 25 years older than him, and so she did die before he did. And he found himself in 1975 again single. And so Derek Prince said to the Lord, I'm fine, I'm content, I can be single the rest of my life. And he had lived in Jerusalem in those years that had gone by, and now he was living in other places. And he began to sense, maybe God is bringing me back to live in the city of Jerusalem. And so again, he began to seek God about, was he possibly supposed to move back to Jerusalem? By coincidence, a friend of his said, there is a particular person that lives here in Jerusalem, and it's a woman who has experienced a great deal of difficulty with her back, and she really needs healing. And Derek Prince had a real anointing for ministering to people in the area of healing, and specifically with backs, and he said, great, I'll be glad to go pray for her. And so he went to Ruth Baker's house with this person, they prayed for her, and they left, really didn't have immediate contact. A few days later, he's praying about, am I to move back in Jerusalem, to Jerusalem? And he saw a vision, and he saw in this vision the beginning of a path. But it was a steep uphill path, and it had a lot of winds and zigzags in it till it came to the top, to the end of the path. But he noticed sitting at the base of this path that was the uphill path was a woman. And in this vision, it dawned on him, the woman he was seeing was this Ruth that he had prayed for, the healing of her back. Now, the interesting thing was that because he was now internationally known as a minister, one of the challenges that he found was that Ruth had been married to a Jewish man who didn't embrace when she became a believer and departed and, and ended up divorcing her. And he had had this understanding with some other spiritual leaders that none of them would make major decisions in their life unless all of them were in agreement that they had heard from God and felt peace about the decision they were making. And so he went to these friends and shared with them what he believed was what God had showed him about the future with Ruth. And they all three looked at him and said, we don't have a witness. And so he decided that he would let God work it out. He wouldn't ignore what he had said to them of being in covenant relationship. And it was about a three-year period before each of them came to a place and they said, we now have peace and we believe that you are supposed to be married to her. And for the next 20 years, he would have powerful ministry that again would involve this person God had placed in his life as a companion to walk through those years. But there was this uphill zigzag path that got him to the place of the marriage. What's the point of all that? How important it is to know that there is a spiritual compatibility with the person that you believe you're going to spend your life with. I mean, the truth is, we live in a world that's very self-oriented. Have you ever noticed that? 
Have you ever watched commercials on TV? Commercials are never about other people. They're about you. How you're going to be happier when you use that product. How your clothes are going to be cleaner and smell better than everybody else's. How everything is for you. You deserve the very best. And we live in a very focused world on me. How many of you have an iPhone? Yeah. And that's my phone. It's all about us. And in that world, how in the world then do you get involved in relationship where now you share everything? And you marry somebody and you roll up the toothpaste from the bottom and they squeeze it from the top. know what I'm talking about the idiosyncrasies the things and and, and then the very fact and, and you really want to get into it start talking about money where you're going to spend the money what's so important I can't tell you how many things we bought with the money for my 70 inch TV and we don't have the TV we have those other things and yet marriage was intended by God to be relationship that brought two people and made them one. Look with me in the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them and the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But still there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last the man exclaimed, This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Begins with the Spirit. There's really several stages of the pursuit of compatibility. I say pursuit because it's not something that's just a done deal. When I shared about Derek Prince, just because he had profound spiritual experiences that led him to those two women for those periods of his life, there was still the living out of relationship that is required. It isn't just something that is magic. It does involve commitment to living out the compatibility. It begins by seeking that which is pleasing to God and seeking for the compatibility in relationship. I would say to someone who's not married today, it's important that you know what you're looking for in a mate. And I'm not just talking about what they look like, although that is important. I'm talking about what are the characteristics of that person, and that's what we're going to talk about in these weeks, the characteristics that make that person the right kind of person for you to spend the rest of your life with what's important is to not just know you're going to seek that but when you enter into that relationship that you establish that compatibility a lot of people assume because they get starry eyes when they see someone and they get married that they're going to live happily ever after and unfortunately, it doesn't always work out that way. Some marriages that start out really well go south. And they happen in worlds where both people are not committed to establishing what that compatibility should be. 
It's important to affirm the compatibility, to go back and say, yes, these are the things that are compatible in our relationship. And then you build on that and you renew so that you recognize there's a process that's going to be a continuous part of the relationship between two people as they become one. So as we look at this spiritual compatibility, what are some of the things that are important for us to think about with that? The very first one is, do you know that you have connected with a person who is a person of peace to you? You know, uh, when Saw and Manuela Ball were with us last year, they talked about what they do in reaching a group of people who are Muslim. And they talked about a concept that people who have great success in reaching people who are Muslim understand and engage. And that is that they don't go out and look for people who are hardcore, radical, Islamic believers and try to convert them. It doesn't work real well in most of those situations. But what they do find is they find a person who is a person of peace to them. It's based on the principle of what Jesus taught when he sent the disciples out in the 70 out. And he basically told them to go into the city and look for a person who in essence would be a person of peace to them. Someone that you just click with, that you connect with, that you sense they are open to you. And there is that willingness for them to be open to what you have to share with them. And they are willing to... To serve you they're willing to be in connection with you and that becomes a ripe opportunity for evangelism one of the reasons we sometimes don't get great, great results when we do evangelism is we just go out and cold call and we go out and we just beat people up with the gospel who aren't open and when we do that we're gonna get some results but what great results you get when you go to people that God has prepared their hearts and they have an openness in what they do. So it's a very important understanding of understanding a person of peace in that concept. But you see, it doesn't end there. In all of our relationships with life, we need to be people who live in peace. Look with me at Colossians 3.14. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. So it's important that in a marriage relationship that you look, to have peace within the home. Ha have you ever walked into a place and you just sense peace in the atmosphere? On the other hand, have you ever walked into a place and you can feel tension? Have you ever walked into somebody's home and you can cut the tension with a knife and everybody's being nice to each other and they're being nice to you, but you can't wait to get back out of there because you can tell that they are not happy with each other. There was some kind of major conflict before you got there or they've been hating each other for a long time and just pretending. How important it is to be in a place of peace. And that's an important element to look for in looking for spiritual compatibility. Is there a person that you sense this peace? They share strong commonality with you in values of faith that are important within their life. And their spirit resonates with your spirit. And the reason that spirit will resonate is because both spirits are resonating with the spirit of God. But there is also that sense of recognizing that you are connected to that person. And there is that sense of spiritual connection that comes because they're a person of peace. A lot of people assume that if someone says, I'm a Christian, then that means you're spiritually going to be together. Now, here's the challenge of that. We have Christians who are all over the map with their theology. And if you have two people who meet and one of them comes from a theological background that says the gifts of the Spirit ended with the book of Acts and the gifts of the Spirit are not for today. And they're a strong believer in Jesus. They know he's their Savior, he's their Lord, but they do not believe spiritual gifts can operate today. And they come up and they meet someone 
who is just a fanatical, believing, tongue-talking, just out there, spirit-filled person who is just gung-ho for God with all the gifts of the Spirit. They are both spiritual people, but they're not very spiritually compatible. Their spirits are not going to connect well because they're in different spectrums of how they're viewing the theology of the gifts of the Spirit. It's important that the spirits be in harmony, and it's important to recognize, is this a person who is tender to God, and are they tender to others, and will they be tender to you? Are they someone who has that sense that you can tell they really genuinely are going to care? And so it's important in looking at developing spiritual compatibility that that is a part of what that is. So what do you do in looking for that person of peace? That's the kind of person that you seek. And that's what you establish as you begin to develop the relationship. And that's what you affirm and then you build on what you have. So you say, okay, I've been married to somebody for 10 years and we have a lot of struggle. There's a lot of challenges. What do we do? Well, begin to recognize that it's important to live in peace. And if that person is a believer you're married to, maybe it's time that you have conversation about whether there's peace within your home. And how do you establish that peace? Because the Word of God says He will cause even your enemies to become at peace with you. So it's good news for you. That enemy you're living with under the same roof could become the person of peace within your life. Now you may be at a place where the marriage is already ended and you can't beat yourself up for what didn't happen. But it's important to recognize how do you build and then how do you renew so that you allow that to be a strength of what the marriage is. The next thing that's important is to recognize the power of triune relationship. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9. Two people are better off than one for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. It's interesting because the concept of triune relationship is so important in how God designed things. He created each one of us, really, with three distinctive parts. You are a spirit. You have a mind or soul, and you live in a body. All of those are parts of who you are. They're not separated in the sense of they don't have their own lives, but they are all a part of making up the life of who you are. God himself is recognized as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There are not three different people, but there are three persons represented in one. It is in the Trinity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Jesus said to the disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because there's such amazing harmony between those. Years ago, I used to tune pianos, and on a piano, you have three strings on one note when you get into the middle and upper registers of the piano. And all three of those strings have the ability to have their own sound. But when a piano note is in tune, you do not hear three distinct sounds. You hear one sound, and yet there are three strings making such a harmonious sound that you only hear one note. And that's the trinity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So wouldn't it make sense that what God would desire is what Ecclesiastes talks about. The ability of binding together and threading together this rope of love and life that includes a man and a woman who have each individually connected their lives to Christ 
And then with him woven into that relationship, you have a powerful three-stranded cord because the very life of Christ individually in them connected together with the life of who he is as the eternal son of God provides a profound opportunity for the Christian experience and expression. What do you do if you're not married? That's something you seek for, that you look to develop. If you are getting in a relationship or you're married, you establish that. Then you affirm it, you build it, and you renew it. It's also important that there is a synergy of oneness. Ephesians 5, 31. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. I think this is a challenge for us. And the very first thing is that you need to recognize, have you first become bound to Christ yourself before you look for someone else. If you're a single person, the very best thing that you can do in your world is establish your relationship with Christ. Don't count on someone else bringing it to you. That's something that you build and are responsible for. It's something that is greater than the marriage itself. And yet when you have two people bound to Christ and then together they are bound to Christ together that creates that cord and there is a sense of oneness that begins to come in that kind of a relationship. It's an interesting thing that happens over time. Now we live in a world that this idea of oneness is such a challenge because we live in a world where I want to be me. And so a lot of people look and say, okay, I'm going to be married, but, but you know, I'm going to maintain my own world. I'm going to have my own bank account. I'm going to have my friends. I'm going to have the part of my world that's different. And I'm going to keep things separately because I don't want to just lose myself in that other person. And there is codependency that's very unhealthy where you have a person who is totally dependent on the other person and they each gain some kind of an unhealthy ability to function together because they've developed this codependent relationship. But the true relationship of oneness is an interdependency that says ultimately we are dependent on God. We both recognize that's where our dependency is, but out of that dependency, I have the ability from what he's done in me to minister to someone else. And when both people engage in that understanding, then the marriage becomes an interdependency where you're depending on the God in your mate and the mate is depending on the God in you and there's a powerful oneness that begins to come in the purpose and plans of what God can do with that what it then does it gives you the power to combine the strengths that you each possess each person in a relationship have strengths that the other person doesn't have and yet sometimes those become competitive you know wait a minute my job's more important than your job, or, or I can do this better than you can. But instead of looking at it from the standpoint of making sure I'm going to protect my strength, look at it from a standpoint of how those strengths brought together cause you to be able to live a larger life than you would have been able to live if it was dependent on just your strengths alone. And the weaknesses that you have, instead of you looking and saying, oh no, I've got to walk through this weakness by myself, you become strong for each other, and there becomes that sense of caring that makes the difference. You know, it's been very interesting through the years. I've dealt with couples where one of the couple's members was an alcoholic, and the other person wasn't. And so the person that was an alcoholic could not be around people drinking alcohol without it becoming such a temptation to them that literally they would fall every time. They're married to this person that doesn't have that issue. And so that person doesn't understand why when they go out to dinner, that person doesn't need to get a drink. That's okay with them, but I'm still going to have one anyway. 
And when you begin to be, develop a sense of oneness, you begin to recognize that your strength is an opportunity to minister to their weakness. So that if that's the challenge, if that person who is not an alcoholic really loves that person who is, they recognize I am one with them. And if they are struggling and will not be able to overcome that, if I am one with them, I'm struggling with that and won't be able to overcome it. Because we are one. And the strength in me will carry the weakness in them. That's what begins to develop in that kind of an atmosphere. And what it does, it takes a person on the journey of becoming soulmates. Well, that's a deal that you could spend a lot of time on. The idea of there's a soulmate out there for you and you've got to find that person. I do believe there's connections just like what I shared that happened in Derek Prince's life. And I do believe that God brings people to that sense of knowing this is a person and it's there. But I'm also convinced of this, that soulmates are not brought together as some magic moment and poof, it's done and everything else is on automatic. Soulmates are people who engage in the journey of compatibility and determine they are going to walk through it so that the oneness in them isn't something that they just magically found. It's something that both are so committed to that it builds the healthiness of what the relationship ought to be. Again, it's that, that process, seek, establish, affirm, build, renew. And then finally living out that sacred union. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. The man who finds a wife finds a treasure, and he receives favor from the Lord. And every woman said... <laughs> it's important that in a relationship, you make sure you have time with God because that strand in the cord is the greatest strength it bound with the other two elements of the husband and wife are going to give strength so literally the cord can't be broken if the other two cords firmly wrap around that cord of Jesus it's important that that be a process in life it's important that you learn how as individuals, but also as couples, how to develop a rhythm of life of abiding in Christ and being fruitful. That balance of rest and work. We seem to be people who don't know how to keep things in balance. We're, we're driven people. I, I catch myself, I get caught up in projects. And when I get caught up in a project, it's hard for me to not determine that somehow, some way, I'm going to make it happen. I decided on Friday afternoon that I'd plant some annuals for our, for our front yard. And I'd been working in the yard, and I had this whole schedule of everything I wanted to do. And it gets late in the afternoon, and as I'm ready to do some of that last-minute work, all of a sudden I start feeling something on my head, and it's raindrops. I've just planted these flowers, but I got some other areas I want to dig up. Now, I remember being very frustrated Friday evening because the driven part of me said, wait a minute, I do not need rain right now because I want to get this work done outside and I don't want to get soaked doing it. But the flowers I just planted desperately need the rain. But I'm so driven, I want the rain, rain go away, come again some other day. And we live life like that. We want it on our terms, and we don't know how to function. And this is the other challenge. When you're involved in a relationship, now it's not just your choice of is this a time to rest and is this time of work. It means that you've got to work together with schedules and the challenges of jobs and kids and all the other stuff in life. Who's going to walk the dog? Get rid of the dog. I just gave great seeds for a good fight at lunch today. <laughs> but the issue is, are we willing to be people 
who learn to do that in developing this spiritual relationship. The other thing is to learn to live from the principle of first fruits. Do you give your first and best to God? It's true in your finances, and that's where we usually spend the most time talking about that, and that's a reality. But do you give the best of your time, of your talents to God? And then do you look and say, where does God then want that to next be expressed? And that would be to the person you're becoming one with. What a powerful thing it is when two people learn how to flow together with saying, we're going to give as a couple the very best of what we have to God. And then we learn how to live out the rest. Because you begin to learn to live life on mission. Because you see, when we read that Ephesians 5 verse, it says, it's a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. The question is, do you recognize that the purpose of two being made one is to live out the fullness of Christ? And so if you're not married, seek for this. It's the foundation of everything else we'll talk about in these weeks. This sense of the spiritual compatibility. If you are in a marriage relationship, establish it. Maybe you've been in the marriage for a while and you look and you say there's struggles in some of these areas. Then if both people will commit to it, you establish. If the other person is, commit, is not committed, you do what you can. There's sometimes you're not going to be able to fix it. And I'm not here to put guilt trips on people today who've been in marriage relationships that haven't worked. What I'm saying is God takes you from where you are today and let him begin to work in what he can do through you to build the best of what your life is yet to be. And to begin to look, and as a couple today, I challenge you to affirm each other. To be able to go back and affirm what God's done in the spiritual relationship you have and then build together and renew. You know, most of you know that Grace and I have been married just a little over two years. And it's an interesting thing as we begin to compare notes and begin to realize that shortly before we met, both of us had a time that we set aside and did some real prayer and fasting about the future of our lives. What did God have for us? What was his will? How could we surrender to the fullness of what God would do? Neither one of us knew the other was doing that because we didn't know each other yet. And yet both of us had come to that place of establishing the opportunity for God to work. And it was a very short time later that through that just uh, very spiritual channel called Christian Mingle that we met used to knock those kind of things a lot. Now I'm pretty sold. But you better know what you're doing. And it's interesting how that as God began to bring us together, that Grace had gone on Christian Mingle to cancel her account. And there happened to be an email there the day that she was going to close the account out. And she waited a week before she decided to even open it. Well, I'm sure glad she opened it. <laughs> and then we begin to correspond through email. And you know what began to happen as we then met and we spent hours one morning in a little cafe in Zeeland, Michigan, and the next day, we spent a total of about eight hours on the phone. And the thing that's really comical is that neither one of us like to talk on the phone. And you know what began to be, began to be obvious? That we were persons of peace. That there was that sense that I talked about this morning that God had established in us. 
because we both had sought his will not about us but about him and then in that individual seeking of God the beginning of this triune relationship was being formed and I remember when a couple of years ago this past March that we stood in this very place and we begin to live out what it was to take this spiritual journey and, and at our wedding for us it was just a very meaningful time to have the opportunity since we were embracing this life together in ministry to serve communion to those who gathered for the wedding and that was just a very profound experience for both of us and yet this is the thing that becomes an interesting thing to realize is that the day we got married we didn't look and say oh spiritual compatibility check and now we can just move on with life you know what we found out is that the sacred union is that ability to continuously let God work this process in us it's that thing that I talk about it is the seeking it's the establishing it's the continuing to recognize and establish these things as priority and for us the spiritual compatibility is not something we take for granted it's something that we establish in the busyness of life you still have to find those times that you say we need to pray together and you make that a priority because you're establishing that compatibility that brought you together you affirm it in the conversation that you share last night as I frequently kind of share with grace what I'm going to be talking about on Sundays and we begin to talk about this it was such a time of affirmation to me personally of what I'm talking to you about today I don't want these to just be theoretical ideas I want it to be something that I believe enough to live out and then to recognize that it's something we're going to continue to build that, that the spiritual compatibility is not something that's done it's something that's going to be a continuous process and then renewing continuing to let God do that work that's what's become a challenge for us and you guys get to be right in the middle of the fishbowl with us does every day go perfectly no grace doesn't always do what I tell her to do that is a joke you know the reality is that it is that determination that says this is how I will live and so today if you're single I challenge you to look at where your spiritual life is and make the kind of priorities we're talking about and don't engage in marriage without that being established if you're married determine you're gonna live it out and determine that you're going to build together now, I will tell you this is a miracle right here he didn't really mean me he meant me coming up here yes this is <laughs> I am following the Holy Spirit's leading right now um, I just want to share something with you it was something that I was convicted of and it so fits in with um, and I apologize um, for interrupting, but um, I just want to share with you a testimony. Um, when I came to this church, and when G I knew before Pastor and I met that God it was calling me into ministry in some capacity, I did not envision this, um, and yet I knew He was calling me into ministry. And so when I got here, I said, Okay, God, I'm ready. I'm ready. And I kept looking around, waiting, 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 and starting to get frustrated. And I said, okay, God, when are you calling me into ministry? And so in one morning, sorry, I'm shaking. In one morning in my devotions, all of a sudden God spoke to me and he said, can I trust you with my son? And I said, well, of course, God, that's why I'm in ministry. That's why I want to be in ministry. And he said, no, can I trust you with my son? And I said, well, God, of course you can. I love you. You know, 
I want to proclaim your son. I want to share your son with people. Just let me know where, when I'm there. And he said, no, can I trust you with my son? And he gave me a vision of my husband. And at that moment, I knew that besides my relationship with my father, the most important mission that he was calling me to was to take care of his son. And so I'm asking you whether you're married or not, single, in a relationship or not, we are Christians, we are sons and daughters of Christ. So I'm just asking you this morning, can God trust you with his children, his son or daughter, whichever person is your, your relationship, can God trust you with his children? I want to pray for you this morning. I want to pray for you if you're single today, for God to strengthen you and encourage you. If you're in a marriage that's struggling today, I want to pray for you. If you're in a marriage that's strong, I want to pray for you. That in all of our ways, God will help us to be the people that we're called to be. And that we will understand the truth of His Word and how to live out the compatibility that He intended when He created Adam and Eve. Father, help us. God, I do pray for those that are not in a relationship right now or maybe in a relationship, but it's not yet a marriage relationship. God, would you just cause them to seek you for your face in their future and what you want to do. I pray for those who are going through divorce right now that you would just heal the hurt and not cause them to feel shamed because they've gone through what feels like a failure and what we've talked about. God, help them to have hope that their life is not over, that you have plans, you have future, you have hope. I pray for those that are in marriages that they love each other, but they're struggling. God, help them to hear the truth today and be drawn to what you want to do in that relationship. I pray for those that are in strong marriages, that you would cause us to recognize that we are a family on mission, that we are called to your purposes, to balance the rest of the work and to be everything that you called us to be. Do that work in each of us, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps you walked in today or you're joining online and you don't know the Lord. In just a moment, I'm going to pray a simple prayer and you can invite Jesus to come into your heart and just pray that prayer with me. And so right now, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'd just like to know who I'm praying that prayer with. If you say, I'm going to pray that prayer with you, I'm going to ask Jesus to come into my heart. Would you just slip up your hand and hold it a minute till I can see it? Then you can put it right back down. We're going to pray that prayer together. Thank you. If you're joining us online, pray this prayer with us right now. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. Forgive my sins. Give me eternal life. I receive you now. Thank you for being my Savior. Amen. I really hope you enjoyed the worship experience at LifeBridge Church. So glad you joined us online. And if you prayed that prayer and asked Jesus to come into your heart today, I really want to send you a Bible and some other information that will help you. You can just click there on the screen that you accepted Christ, and I'll send that information right out to you. Also, if you have any area that you need prayer, just click I Need Prayer. And we'll be glad to include and believe God for whatever needs you have in your life to be fulfilled. Thank you again so much for joining us. We appreciate all you who are a regular part of LifeBridge Online. And if you would like to contact us, we'd love to hear from you and know that you're enjoying your time with us. Simply let us know at info at lifebridgechurch.com. See you next week.